still haven't seen it, so no spoilers even still. Um, but we've been looking at the character and the attributes of God. How many of you know that God's extremely incredible? He has incredible attributes and so many things about him. And so this morning we're going to look at another name of God, and that is Jehovah Sid Canoe. Everyone say Sid Canoe. Sid Canoe. Isn't that an interesting name? Uh, so turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6. Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6. It says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely, and this is the, time, and this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness, which means Jehovah Sidkenu. Father, in Jesus' name, we, again, we thank you for uh, Brother Sean and Pastor Shanna. God, we ask you to continue to move upon their lives. And Lord, uh, and as we're in your word this morning, we ask God that you would speak to us very clearly. Help us to understand your word. Help us to practice it and to walk it out every single day in our lives. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jehovah Sidkenu, we look at the character of God. God's character has a lot of different aspects to it. And some people, uh, last night we had a, a leadership uh, outing and uh, we were just, sometimes we, we were having a lot of fun. And some people would uh, look at that and say, wow, that's a character. They're having, uh, they're, they were acting out, they were cutting up, and they're just a character. And, but then there's other things about our lives where our character means a lot, doesn't it? When you describe a person and they say, well, that person is trustworthy, that person is a person of integrity, that person is this, that person is loving, that person is kind. Or if they are the flip side of that, they describe that person in a negative light, in a negative way, then we are describing that person's character, attributes of that person. And this morning, we sang about the character of God. We sang about how good he is, all the great things that he does, all the things that he's desiring to do for each one of us. And we are speaking about God's character and the attributes of him. Each name that God uses for himself reveals to us an aspect of his character that helps us to know him better. Right here in Jeremiah chapter 23, the prophet Jeremiah spoke this prophecy the kingdom of Judah was about to fall. The land of Judah was full of idolatry, oppression, violence, and political revolution. The northern kingdom of Israel had gone into captivity 100 years before Judah seemingly learned from God's judgment upon them. And it was under these conditions that God gave this prophecy of Jehovah Sidkenu to Jeremiah. What does Sidkenu mean? Well, the word Sidkenu is derived from the word Sedek which means righteousness. Sedek is translated as right, righteous, righteousness, just, justify, declare innocent. So a simple definition of righteousness is doing that which is right. That's pretty simple, isn't it? This name speaks of the fact that God will always do that which is right. Why? Because he is righteous. Righteousness exalts a nation. Scripture says that. Why are we looking to our society and our world to do what's right when we're not right? Only God himself is right. You and I are called to live a righteous lifestyle. What's going on around you and I is not right. There's a lot of things going on that is not right. You watch the news, you look at it, and you say, well, that's just not right. You discipline your children, and you say, well, that's just not right. Because we are, we are in dire need today for people to stand up and recognize Jehovah Sidkenu and start being people of righteousness and living right lives. Amen? Thank you, two of you. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 9, verse 27. God always does what is right. Then Pharaoh sent and called Moses and Aaron and said to them, This time I have sinned. The Lord is in the right. And I and my people are in the wrong. Come on, could we just get to the place in our lives this morning where you and I start to admit that this time I've sinned. But the Lord, 
He is right. Amen? This time. And it's a daily walk that, that our salvation, we work it out daily with fear and trembling. So the Lord is always right. Look at Psalms 129, verse 4. The Lord is what? Righteous. He has cut the cords of the wicked. There's a slang word that goes around in today's hip society, and I've heard this many, many times, and where guys will say, wow, that's righteous. That's righteous. But we don't really understand what is righteous. It's either ratchet or it's righteous. <laughs> right? It's either ratchet or it's righteous. And the Lord is righteous. He has cut the cords of the wicked. So this morning, as we dig into this message, there's some things that I just want Jehovah Sidkenu to really get deep into our hearts and lives. Because I don't whether you realize it or not, God is a God of grace. We do believe in grace around here. We do believe in that. But grace is never a permission to live however we want, we want to live. Grace is never permission to live unright. Grace is permission for us to live a righteous lifestyle. It is the kindness of, Lord, of the Lord that leads us to repentance. And so Jehovah Sidkenu is the Lord is our righteousness. But let's look at this this morning. The first thing we want to dig into is not only is he, a, is he righteous, number one, he is a righteous ruler. He's a righteous ruler. Jeremiah 23, verse 6, he said, in, the days, in his days Judah will be saved. Whose days is he talking about? He's talking about this righteous ruler who's going to be Jesus. And Israel will dwell securely, and this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Understand, prophet Jeremiah is giving a prophecy right here. Right living. Since no man, no man since Adam had lived sinless, how could man become righteous before God? How could man become righteous before God? It, it was going to require something unique. No regular stuff would work. A ruler who will live right. Jeremiah is prophesying this. A ruler who will live right. No one has completely done this before. If you're following along with us in the yearly Bible reading, you will see that Israel had a good king and Israel turned and they came back to God. Then after that, they had two or three bad kings and Israel did what was wrong in the eyes of God. And have you seen that pattern continue into the day, today of the, today's society? People will fall. People will come to a right standing with God and then... They'll go three, four months, and they'll be not, they, they won't be in right standing with God. What happens? This righteousness is, is leaving our lives. So this would require something unique. No other stuff would work. A ruler who would live right. No one has completely done it before, but God promises that someone will, a ruler who will live righteously before God and before man. Who would that person be? This person would be Jesus Christ. This person would, Jesus would be wise. In his day, there will be salvation. He will be the Lord, our righteousness. He will bring us into right relationship to God. This is the idea of righteousness that all of you, all of us, not only in this church, but outside the walls of this church, the idea of righteousness is that we would have a right standing before God. Pastor Shanna is getting ready to leave Montana, and in doing so, she's going to have to make a request to the Louisiana District Council and ask them to transfer her ordination from the, Ohio, from the uh, Louisiana District Office of the Assemblies of God and transfer it, transfer it to the Montana District. And with that transfer, that transfer letter will come a letter from our superintendent saying that she's in right standing with this district. Now, if they don't write, sign off on her, if there's red flags or this or that, they would say, well, we don't clear her, so we can't transfer it yet. Do you understand what I'm saying? Righteousness is being in right standing with God. And so is there, if, that's why we've got to constantly, daily, Lord, search me, try me. Am I in right standing with you today? Lord, am I in right standing with you when I'm tempted? God, am I in right standing with you when I'm about to go off with my mouth? God, am I in right standing with you when I'm involved in this business dealing that I know I probably shouldn't be in? Righteousness is about being in right standing with God. This, this Jesus, this Jehovah Sidkenu, destroys the idea that righteousness can be achieved by our own deeds or good works. Come on, we don't get saved by good works, amen? We don't stay saved by good works, but we are called to do good works. 
it will be accomplished through a right relationship with this ruler, a right relationship with Jesus Christ. Can, let me just say this this morning. There are a lot of people today who said, who've come and their names have been recorded in the last book of life, but they are not in a right relationship with Jesus Christ. It's one thing to get saved. It's another thing to stay saved and remain saved. Amen? Amen. We're talking about righteousness. Just because you said the sinner's prayer and you went into a baptismal tank and you went down and you came up and you got your certificate, praise God, all of that is great. But are you in a right relationship with God? Are you living a life of righteousness? Is there enough evidence against your life that a judge would call you guilty for being a sold-out believer in Jesus Christ? Amen? Relationship, being right and right standing in your relationship with Jesus. As great as the deliverance of Israel from Egypt was, this ruler, Jesus' deliverance, will be even greater. The former gave Israel a new land. The latter, Jesus, will give them a new life. Moses led them toward a new property. Jesus would give them a new position. The former glory will be nothing compared to the latter. Come on, we've got some great things coming to the Lord, from us from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? The former glory would be nothing but the, 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 compared to the latter. The new righteousness from the new ruler will greatly outdo the old righteousness. It won't be our efforts or our wealth or our position that gets us into this new life. It will be the new ruler himself in this life. It will be Jesus Christ who gets us to where we need to go. So we have a restored life for all who accept this righteous ruler who's Jesus Christ. Are you tracking with me this morning? So we have a righteous ruler. Next we look at righteousness received. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. Verses 6 through 15. It'll be on the screen. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Come on, somebody, that should get somebody excited. I am free in Jesus' name. My trespasses, my debts have all been paid by him. Jesus is not only the starting point of righteousness, but he's the continual flow of it. When you get saved, that's just the beginning. Can I just say this in this Assembly of God church this morning? Just getting saved is just not enough. Hello. It's not something, and we, we model this a lot in America church. I believe, and I, I'm a soul winner. I want people to get saved. I do. And you'll have an opportunity to respond to that this morning. But it's what, what happens after that? I mean, come on. How many of you mamas, any mamas here this morning? When you had that baby, was it just enough to have that baby? That baby gets a little messy, don't it? And if you as a mama sat there and said, well, this giving birth was good enough. Come on, we've had enough of those kind of mamas. Hello? Just having a baby is not enough. Now you got to raise and provide for that baby. You got to teach that baby how to live. You got to teach that baby. That baby starts to grow. That baby gets to a place of when they start to walk. And if you don't teach them how to walk, they're never going to walk. If you don't teach them how to get rid of that pacifier, that binky, whatever it is you call it, they're going to continue to suck on something for the rest of their life. And when it, becomes, when it comes to the church and when it comes to people accepting Christ as their Lord and their Savior, you're in the wrong church if you think just getting saved is enough. Just getting saved, yeah, that's going to make, the, yeah, praise God. If I was to die right then, I'm going to heaven. But God has something for you. God has something for you, and it's not just for you to sit and warm a seat cushion. He's called you to a life of righteousness, and not just to be righteous in the church, but to be righteous in the workplace. To be righteous in the school, in the, in the hallways of the school, young people. To be righteous at the home. To live right everywhere. Can we just be honest this morning? Jesus does see what's going on behind closed doors. Right? 
I've pulled up at people's houses before. They look out, uh, they look out the blinds and the blinds closed. They got to go and make some adjustments and changes. And, oh, pastor's here. Jesus is always there. He sees all. He sees all. He sees what's in your refrigerator too. Hello. <laughs> We cannot be righteous without Christ. Come on, there's not a person. Let's all be honest. We all want to be right. Husbands, when your wife says it, yeah, honey, you were right. You know that makes you feel good, doesn't it? I love it when my wife says, you're right. <laughs> Whew. And this makes me like, kind of like stand up. i like, finally. It took 20 years. But she said, you're right. <laughs> When we're living righteous with Jesus Christ, we don't have to be concerned if other people are telling us we're right or not. This has been a tough week for me. I've had different oppositions and things said and this or that that I had to come to terms with. You know what? Am I concerned with what people say? Or if I, God, if as long as I'm in right standing with you, it doesn't really matter what anyone has said. And now don't you dare sit there and wonder what people have been saying. I didn't post about it, I promise that. <laughs> we cannot be righteous without Jesus Christ. Only his robes of righteousness are large enough to cover our filthy rags. We must always depend on Christ to keep us in right standing before God. He is to be the Lord of all of my life, or he's not Lord at all. He's Lord of all, or he's not Lord at all in my life. He is my constant source of righteousness. It's not my good works. It's not my efforts. It's not any positions that you or I hold. It, none of that. It's none of that. He has to be Lord of my whole life or he's not Lord at all. Amen? I can't say that I'm only going to let the Lord be Lord of half of Jack. He's got to be Lord of all of Jack. He can't just be Lord on Sunday. He's got to be Lord Monday through Saturday. He can't just be Lord when I want him to be, and then we can't treat Jesus like the elf on the shelf and we only bring him out at Christmas time. It, we can't have that. He's either Lord at all times, 365 days a year, seven days a week, 24 seven, or he's not. Amen? It's called a, a lifestyle, being disciplined and walking in that. It's not my good works, my efforts, or my positions. This is what produces, what Jesus has done in my life is what produces thankfulness. He's done it. He and him alone has done it. Otherwise, I would be able to thank myself. I mean, how silly would that be? You walking around and you're like, oh, good job, Jack. You did a great job. Good job, Sister Debbie. The presence of God came because of what you did. It's the anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage, not me. Not me. So I've always struggled when someone comes to me and says, Pastor, that was a good word. Well, it wasn't me. It was God. And when they say, Pastor, that was a horrible word, it wasn't me. It was God. His word doesn't return void whether you like it or not. Amen. <laughs> Righteousness it's, it is Christ's garment of righteousness that we wear, not our own. Not, don't disgrace this beauty, the beautiful garment of righteousness. Don't disgrace that. I, I told someone la, uh, towards the end of this last year in, our, in the church who really was just kept tripping up over the same sin, and I looked at him in my backyard in our connect group. We're getting ready to start up those again. And I, and I told him, he stuck around for a while. I said, listen, the sin that you keep tripping in, that does not look good on you. I can see you're wearing it. It doesn't look good on you. But come on, when Jesus puts his cloak of righteousness around you, that looks good on you. Amen? When people look at you and say, wow, there's something different about you. What is it? There's a glow about you. Well, the Lord's in my life, and I've been cloaked with his righteousness. He's put that cloak over me. So don't disgrace the beautiful garment of righteousness. And I wore this coat this morning because there's many different colors. And Joseph wore a coat of many colors, didn't he? And it was placed on him out of favor. It was placed on him by his father. And everyone else in his house started to judge it. Well, just who does he think he is? 
And you know what happened? His brothers, they, got, they come up with a plan to get rid of him. Whoo, come on. But who had the last laugh? And Joseph didn't laugh at him. When he saw him coming down that food pantry line, oh, you want some food now? Hmm. That's how you and I would have been. I'm food pantry commissioner. You, know, who, you, you sold me. You got rid of me. All, you took my coat and you tore it up. You, made, you went back to dad and you told him that I was dead. And now you're in my food pantry line and you want some food. Flesh would have said, huh, talk to the hand. You ratchet. You out of here. Uh, you're not getting any of this food. There's famine. No, but a righteous man of God walking in right standing with God. Could have pointed his finger at his brothers, but no. Restored them. Fed them. Amen? That's what righteousness will do. Righteousness is not vindictive. Vengeance belongs to the Lord anyway. That coat, that coat of many colors changed Joseph's life. So should the coat of Christ's righteousness change ours. The world judges goodness by what it sets up as the standards of goodness. Have you looked around and saw all these different things in the business world and it says, this is what you've got to do to climb the corporate ladder? The world says, this is the standard for you to be good? We tell, in sports, we have a standard when we're coaching and we tell players, this is the, the level you've got to get to if you want to be good. Come on, even in the church, we've gotten to the place where we've said, we've got to have things like this, like this, like this in order for it to be good. And we measure, and everything is measured. In the marketplace, even in the military, even in the schoolhouse, everything is measured, right? Am I wrong? Every, even, after, even the way you raise your own kids, your, your own parents and in-laws are measuring you because they're, they're, you're not raising your family the way you were raised, and so therefore in their minds it's not good. And the church has adopted that model that the world has adopted. And we said, and we say things like, well, what was a win for you in church today? And we have these, this terminology going on in our churches today that says it was a win if the church house was packed, because that's a good indication that God's moving. You know, I'm gonna tell you something. I'm gonna tell you what's a huge win for me. The fact that a young man got healed of cancer. One, one, one young man got healed of cancer. That's a huge win. That's immeasurable. The fact that a couple is being obedient to the voice of God and they're going to where God's calling them next. See, God, we've got to understand something, and I get sick of this because people get mad, they get offended, and they leave a church and they go somewhere else. If God calls you to something, if, God, if God's calling you to leave a church, that mean he means he's calling you to something. God never calls you to leave just to figure out what it is next. Amen. So when, like the Connors came and sat down with me, Pastor, God's calling us to Montana and this is what he's calling us to do? Well, that makes biblical sense to me. I have no reason, there's no reason in the world why I should not lay hands on them and commission them and bless them to go. Amen? But when someone says, you know what, I'm just upset and I'm offended and I'm just gonna go somewhere else and figure out what God wants me to do, that's not biblical. Amen? It's not. I'm talking about righteousness, being in right standing with God, being in the perfect will of God. Righteousness. As God's people, righteousness cannot and must not be determined by this world or the standards that this world has set, but by Christ and his written word. We are to reject this world's thinking and standards that don't line up with Jesus Christ. Even this world makes its standards sound so reasonable. Come on, that's why we've adopted it so much. The world makes their, their, their logic and it makes their reasons sound so appealing to all of us. But doesn't Romans 12 tell us not to be conformed to the ways of this world any longer, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds? I happen to be born in this state 
and the government gave me, or the doctor hospital gave me a birth certificate, but before I was even formed in the womb of my mother, the God of the universe, Jehovah Sidkenu, knew that I was going to be formed. And he already had a plan commissioned. He already had a plan in store. And that doctor, when he smacked my backside and he said, lady, it's a boy. Isn't that interesting that the doctors don't get confused on gender? Good, congratulations, it's a boy or it's a girl. I'm going to leave that one alone for a minute. (laughs) I really wanted to go there. (laughs) And even though I was born into a family that wasn't a Christian, God's plan and his will is still being fulfilled. Right? Because it wasn't about their works to get me to where I'm at today. God's somehow maneuvered things and what the enemy intended for evil because at at four months old, I was supposed to die in the hospital. But what the enemy intended for evil, God still began to work a plan. Why? Because God, at that moment, he still had a call on my life, even though my parents didn't understand it, my, my grandparents didn't know about it. But And then later in life, at the age of 15, I came in, I'm on a collision course with the perfect plan of God. And when I got saved... Now the Lord was like, okay, I can't just leave you at the saved point. You've got to move on to the next point. Now you've got to get baptized because I'm going to make you righteous. You're going to start to live right. You're going to do what's right in my eyes. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes just like you and I. That's why we come to the Lord and we ask him to forgive us. And then at the age of 17, he said, Jack, I want you to now preach my gospel. And so I preached my first sermon at 17. And then at 19, I ran from it, and I got hurt, and I lost my scholarship in college. And I still aborted the plan of God, but the plan of God didn't abort me. That's going to sink into somebody here in a minute. You can try to walk away from the plan of God for your life, but the plan of God for your life is still not going to walk away from you. And you can run from it all you want to, but you're going to keep tripping up. You're going to find it five years down the road, five months down the road. You're going to keep running into it. The world will try to make you think that its standards sound so reasonable. They may even be logically convincing to you and I, but they are still lies if they contradict the word of God. Anybody ever met a convincing liar? Yeah. That lie sounds so good, you thought it was gospel. Isn't Satan like that? Isn't he the father of lies? He brings us to a righteous life. Christ has all of it. He has everything we need. I like what Mark Twain said. He said, heaven goes by favor. If it went by merit, you would stay out and your dog would go in. <laughs> Think about it. In Christ, we have it all. In Christ, we have it all. All the righteousness we need, we have in Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus is our righteousness. In him we are accepted and we are clean. In Christ the work of righteousness is clean. Like what Croft Pence said. He said, there is a difference between religion and salvation. Religion is man trying to do something for God. Salvation is God doing something for man. Praise God we have a righteous life. We can live free from condemnation. We, now we overflow with thankfulness. How many of you are thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ being upon your life? Amen? And I promise you, if we would even begin to live a little more thankful every day, I don't know what's promised. I don't know what you're going to face Monday. I don't know what you're going to face tonight. But I promise you, if you change your perspective, I promise you, if you wake up tomorrow morning and quit saying, oh, my God, it's Monday, and you get up out of bed and your feet hit the ground and you had breath come out of your lungs and you say, thank you, Jesus, that it's Monday, marvelous Monday, miraculous Monday. God, you're going to use me to be right today. I'm going to walk in righteousness on a Monday. And when you get to the office and everybody hasn't had their first or seventh cup of coffee and you're walking in with a big old smile, hallelujah, what's up with you? It's Monday. Oh, I don't know, but I got up this morning and I feel good. You're in right standing with God. Any day of the week where you find yourself in right standing with God is a good, good day. Amen? Please don't live your life to where people have to lie about you at your funeral. Amen? 
Number three, righteousness ruling. Look at second, or look at Colossians chapter two, verse 16 through chapter three, verse four. Got it, there we go. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in, in questions of food and drink. Hallelujah, keto or not, hallelujah. <laughs> let, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink, and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are the shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind and not holding fast to, to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with the growth that is from God. Next. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to the things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Next. If then you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's an exciting verses of scripture to me. Regulations are lifeless. Regulations are, right, are, are lifeless. Religious motions don't give us righteousness. Can I even be as bold to say, going through the motions, as many do in our country, of worship. There is a thing in today in our, in our culture called false humility. Going through the motions of regulations. If you come to church just out of obligation, and it's a part of your regulation. Are you really coming for the right reasons? Amen? Are we doing the things of God because we are passionate about doing it? Or are we doing the things of God because it was ingrained into us by our strong religious families that we have to do it? Come on, I pray that everyone's doing what they're doing for Jesus because they're so in love with him. Amen. I pray that we're bringing a sacrifice of praise because we know he deserves it, not because we're just going through the motions and the regulations of something. Unlike other religions that require you to earn your righteousness, we receive ours in Christ as a gift. In our church, we have an amazing ministry called Royal Rangers. Those young boys have to do things to earn their badges. But come on, somebody, you don't have to do anything to earn the blood of Jesus. It's already been given for you and I. Amen? I don't earn my salvation. I receive my salvation as a free gift. I receive the cloak of righteousness as a gift, not to abuse, but to walk in righteousness. I receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, not, not, not to make myself better than anybody, but better than me. Jesus paid the price for our righteousness. The Old Testament laws and practices were all shadows of truth to be found in Christ anyways. When you look at the temple, when you look at the sacrifices and the festivals, those were all practices of all shadows of truth to be found in Christ anyways. Don't let others fool you by making you believe that they are more righteous than you. Some people are just a righteous, pious gas bag. Come on, you ever met some of them in the church? Well, I'm better than you. You know what I gave? You know what I did? Righteousness doesn't exalt itself. Amen? Jesus said if you, if you lift him up, he'll lift you up. We've, got to, we've just got to be humble and walk in righteousness daily. We are either in Christ or we're not. We're either righteous or we're not. We're either saint or we're sinner. Come on, there's no in-between. Amen? Colossians 2.19 tells us that the, the one who, if you read that scripture, it basically boils down and says this, the one who brags on his righteousness has lost touch with God. 
There's some, if you ask them if they're righteous, they're going to tell you how righteous they are. And those people are just ratchet. I should have titled that Righteousness or Righteousness. <laughs> Write this down. Regulations won't control the sinful appetite. Regulations won't control the sinful appetite. Righteousness will control the sinful appetite. And we all have a sinful appetite because the flesh wants what the flesh wants. Regulations can't keep us from giving into that. But the righteousness of God living in that and walking in that tells us, I don't need that in my life. I'm going to choose a better path. Yeah, no one's around. Yeah, no one's going to see. But if I allow that little thing to get in my life, and then it's a slow fade, and I begin to drift away, right? Come on, righteousness says, I need to be around godly people. Righteousness says, I do need accountability. Righteousness says, I do need people in my life that's going to check me when I'm wrong. Amen? Amen. I, what I don't need is an arrogant fool getting in my face telling me I told you so. But I need someone that's just a little more righteous than I am right now to put their arm around me and say, hey, I've noticed you're slipping. I've noticed you're not where you need to be in Christ. An arrogant person is going to say, well, you need to be where I'm at. We all forget that we started from somewhere too. Amen? We did. And no, I don't know. That there, if you, has anyone in this, in this church this morning, have you arrived? If you've arrived, would you just stand straight up and just shout hallelujah? Don't, none of us have arrived. We all have this thing that we're working on, this thing called life. Wayne Jacobson said this, spiritual authority flows not from titles and positions, but from a life that is genuine. Spiritual authority flows not from titles and positions, but from a life that is genuine. Friends, this is the secret to overcoming a sinful habit. Quit trying to do it by law and regulations. Rather, let Christ's righteousness be your strength. Let Christ's righteousness be your strength. And come on, there's some of you this morning, I know, because I know your story, I know your life. Keep tripping over the same sin, over the same sin, over the same sin. And you're going to keep tripping if you keep trying to do it according to regulations. Get a hold of the righteousness of God. Allow him to cloak you in his righteousness. You do that, you'll have resurrection living. Friday night, driving home, speaking at uh, Pastor Elliot Morgan's church, the half of the people in my car had fell asleep. I won't mention any names. But I'm just thankful that we didn't have a burning bush in that car. <laughs> but I was thinking, <laughs> I'm not mentioning names, but I was thinking about this, this about right, uh, the resurrection power. And that scripture that says the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the grave now dwells within us. Resurrection power took this righteous ruler who came willingly to this earth and, died and walked as a regular man. Resurrection power took that man who died a criminal's death with the weight of the world on his shoulders, the sins of all mankind upon him. Resurrection living took that man who was buried in a borrowed tomb. Resurrection living, a resurrection power, took him to the very depths of hell. And resurrection power in him kicked the devil right straight in the teeth and said, give me those keys. And resurrection power raised him victoriously from the grave. Resurrection power had him ascend up to heaven where he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and I, waiting for the Lord to say, go, now's time. That same power 
is with inside of you and I. If that same power that did all that in Jesus' life is available to you and I, why can't we resist temptation? Why can't we live righteous? Why do we keep tripping up over things? It's all because there's a way that seems right to a man, but the ends thereof leads to destruction. The world has allowed you and I to buy into what is right according to the world's ways. It's not right. It's not. And we're not living as righteous believers. And come on, Jehovah Sidkenu is in this place this morning. The Lord, our righteousness. And he's looking for people that would rise up in resurrection power, rise up out of their despair, rise up out of their depression, rise up out of their oppression, rise up out of their possession, and live right. Live right. Don't live in such a way that you have to be ruled by the things of this life. Take away fretting over this life. Take away worry over this life. Christ is our life. Resurrection life begins now, not in the future. Yes, Jesus is coming back for the church, and on that great day, the trumpet's going to sound, and the bride, and Christ, the bride of Christ is going to be gone. But that power is calling us out right now to live right before him now. Resurrection life is flowing through us now. Master the worship team if they'll come. Understand this as they come. The Bible teaches us that Christ is our righteousness, not our works, not the gifts we possess, not our friendships with giants, our, not, not because we're friends with the giants of faith, not our positions in the church. It is our righteousness to Jesus Christ, the Lord our righteousness, Jehovah Sidkenu. What does it mean? What is righteousness? Being in right standing with God.